Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to welcome you, uh, Madam, uh, Mr. Minister. Uh, we have uh, worked a lot on this Congress uh, at the interministerial level, and I thank you for it. We worked on the Mediterranean Basin with some very strong announcements on many projects, including Odiseo on this mediation that is necessary and that we need to reinforce. We will be speaking throughout the morning with the Minister of Education, Jean-Michel Blanquer. Thank you for being with us. It's uh, I speak uh, uh, about uh, awareness, which is key because we never protect enough than when we know things well. And unfortunately, and this is my experience as a project leader, it's very hard sometimes to bring it down on the concrete level with the, the right resources and the teams that commit to do the work on the ground. So I'm very happy this morning that we can uh, bring uh, this project uh, into concrete actions to reach out to the largest audience as possible, including the young generations with uh, many initi initiatives that will be presented to you. And of course, uh, an international cooperation dimension that will feed this uh, fascinating debate because we need to open up the borders uh, with these partnerships and this cooperation. Thank you again for being with us this morning. Have a good roundtable, and I will meet you again on the cooperation with natural reserves. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, State Secretary, Mr. Minister, uh, dear friend, dear friends, dear Jean, uh, dear Madam, I want to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Prefe Mr. the Prefect, the project leaders uh, with sustainable development, which are, who are here in large numbers, uh, because uh, for this instance dedicated to biodiversity, we. Um, put down this uh, Congress into the National Education Plan. So thank you for working together yesterday and for being with us this morning. This first session is dedicated to a topic that hasn't been deployed uh, as we could have done and should have done at the request of Mr. Minister is um, the international deployment. It hasn't been identified. And there has been a directive from August 2019 after a major work undertaken with the young generation. This goal was uh, identified with a newsletter, a bulletin. And today, the international factor must become a goal of international of deployment of sustainable development. That's why this first session of the day will be dedicated more specifically to the Mediterranean strategy because we're in Marseille. And uh, from three points of view, the first one is to explain where we're at with this international strategy. And this explanation will be given to us by you, uh, you could, Mr. Santini, uh, you're welcome to uh, join us. And uh, then we'll have two um, two examples of what can be deployed with the two actors. The NEED project, it's the way it is uh, designated with Francois Dyssen, who are in charge of the educative part of the project. And a third point with Jean Strasnik, who will speak about the pedagogical support and material on the UN uh, negotiations in terms of their frameworks. So, Mr. Santoni, I'm going to let you open this roundtable. You have 10 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Samuel, Mr. Minister, to have come. Maybe I'm going to remove my mask to speak, to speak about this subject that is very important. And we haven't spoken about it that much about it, the education to sustainable development. So it, I don't want to go too fast and I will leave uh, you the floor. Of course, the first comment I want to make 
is the significant point of this Congress, of what I've uh, watched and attended, is a new event, is there seems to be a consensus to say that uh, biodiversity should be treated at the same level that climate change. Everybody's agreed on that, and it's been said loud and clear. So I would like to repeat that by the uh, President of the Republic of France as, 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 uh, as of his speech of Friday night when he opened the Congress, which is a new thing. And I really think we should draw the lessons from that. We were uh, a minority uh, to say that for many years and we're not properly heard and now we are heard and I'm very happy about this. The second uh, point is that there's a consensus to say that those two crises are linked and they must be addressed together. If we only take one and not the other, it may be a disaster. Second thing, uh, what I'm what has been put forward is that the Mediterranean region is a hot spot for many reasons and in many fields. It is a hot spot in terms of climate change because climate change goes faster in the Mediterranean region than elsewhere. The Mediterranean warms up quicker, the air and the water and the sea uh, rise is higher as well. So the dangers and the risks linked to climate change are higher in the Mediterranean region and will impact more the populations living in this region, which is an issue because these populations are quite dense and they are all gathered around the coast. The second point is that, and we know that less well, but uh, the Mediterranean is also a hot spot in terms of biodiversity. The action plan that is launched by France um, for the Mediterranean reminds us that the Mediterranean covers only 0.7% of maritime uh, space, but shelters 8% of the wildlife of the world. So you realize the gap between those numbers. I like to quote uh, this uh, comparison that is not in numbers that is easier to remember. There are more vegetal uh, species in the whole department of the Alpes Maritimes than the whole of the UK to tell you how much our legacy is very rich and we're not aware enough of it because people say in the Mediterranean it's dry, nothing grows, uh, it's very hot. Not at all. It's a very rich place in terms of biodiversity. It's also a hot spot from a hydric point of view and we may have conflicts uh, between countries to get access to water. So, of course, uh, a hot spot uh, from a political uh, point of view, it has been, of course, and it's a hot spot as well. From a civilization point of view, if I may use this word, because uh, Athens and Carthage uh, and the Phoenicians, uh, um, very, uh, there are very few regions in the world that so, so many prestigious uh, civilization come one after the other. So the environment and the Mediterranean is a new topic? No, not at all. Read again your plateau and you can see that they were already complaining about the deterioration of the forest in the ancient Greece. It's, so it's quite an old subject. Uh, Kyle Hopper, who is an American historian, published how the Roman Empire uh, fell down and he develops the thesis that the Roman Empire actually was destroyed because of environmental factors. Of course, there were some invasions, but it all happened on an empire that was being vul made vulnerable by environmental crisis. I am not a specialist of the ancient Rome, so I cannot uh, tell you if this is the right thesis to remember or not, but it was published by a leading historian in the US and deserves our attention. What I would like to say is these ancient civilizations found answers to the situation and one of the answers is the model of the Mediterranean city. If you watch the model of the ancient Mediterranean city, what was done before, it's a model of a very compact city, uh, hybrid. Uh, you can do everything by foot. The streets are narrow, so to provide some shade, so the sun doesn't penetrate too much, there is vegetation, the air uh, circulates, and of course uh, it has to be a protected city around the church or behind walls, 
and that's uh, the opposite of what we've done after the years uh, 1930, where we spread out the cities and we put the commercial areas outside of the city center, which means that now you have to take your car to get there. And that increases, of course, greenhouse gas emissions, etc. So we broke with that uh, pattern of that s entire civilization put in place. So what can France do in this context, in the world and in the, uh, in, in, for the Mediterranean? I want to remind you that we have an issue in France that I never quite understood. France was leader leader in the naturalist uh, know-how. Up until the 19th century, the Jean-François Tillère, Jussieu, La Cépède, Monge, Du Banton, uh, we were really the leading country, and it all collapsed in the 19th century. So now we have a real problem with the culture of nature. If you walk around in the US or in the UK, somebody who can recognize the bird species or plant species is, is um, considered as somebody with culture. And in France, our vision of culture is limited to literature or painting or music. So scientific culture is less part of our culture in France than in the Anglo-Saxon countries. Uh, for those of you who know uh, literature, uh, Mr. Minister, I know you are, uh, Mr. Marc Bloch, uh, when he was trying to find the reasons of the collapse of France in 1940, and he goes way beyond the military reasons, he was pointing out the difference between uh, France and Germany in the teaching of botanic. You remember that the, the teaching of botanic completely collapsed between the two world wars, whether it stayed very strong in Germany. And he said that it was a very important factor because the learning of botanic develops your sense of observation, whether it's applied to the military or geostrategic uh, field. So these knowledge uh, in uh, scientific uh, natural science are very weak in France. There was a survey done by BVA a few years ago where f the French were trying to, were asked to remember to recognize three species of trees, oak, uh, charm and uh, birch tree. And the percentage of people to recognize that was 0.05%. So if you cannot recognize the tree species and if you don't learn it in school, it's not about learning everything. But if you don't recognize that uh, to begin with, it will be difficult to understand the erosion of biodiversity. I will uh, conclude by saying that Madame Azoulay, who spoke just before the President of the Republic, reminded us that the UNESCO published a survey recently showing that in uh, the countries uh, studied, 47% included uh, climate change in their education program, and biodiversity was at 19%. So we're way below the numbers that we have to get. I also remind you that the Charter of the Environment has an Article 8 on education and an Article 10 saying that the Charter should inspire the education, the European and French vocation. Uh, so those are articles of law. Um, and a word on the Mediterranean, just to remind you that we we have uh, this uh, article saying to circulate and spread all the knowledge on the marine environment. This is something very clear. This is requested by France and carried by France in the framework of this program. This is also what the Barcelona Convention requests with its protocol of uh, animation, activation, sorry. Uh, they ask in uh, legal documents to integrate in education programs uh, pollution, telluric pollution, uh, uh, marine um, protected areas, or coastal areas. There are two dimensions there, and that will be my conclusion, is it has to be part of the education programs in France, but also those conventions uh, speak about the fact that the countries that the, in the north of the Mediterranean region must help the ones that are in the south of the Mediterranean. And I think that France is in a good position to do that because the Mediterranean uh, region is still a very francophone uh, region, uh, the very strong youth in terms of demographic uh, numbers. And it's a country where France has still a lot of prestige. So I believe that France could play a role beyond what it's at within its own territory to help spreading education to sustainable uh, development in this Mediterranean basin. 
because if we don't spread it elsewhere, what we're doing in France won't have the same impact. So the telluric uh, pollution, if we stop that, which means the pollution comes from the earth, but if we could stop it in France, but if it comes from various coasts and various countries, we won't solve the problem. Sorry, I may have been too long and too short at the same time. I am delighted and honored to take the floor alongside my minister, Jean-Michel Blanquet, with whom we have worked with a topics that are, n that are not so far away and um, topics that justify our ambition and our will to uh, to provide guidance to population in biodiversity, in sustainable development, but we are facing different issues, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't address them in silos. And uh, now we've been working uh, on Odysseo for many years, and this a project has been backed by Owil, and we are convinced that a Medita the Mediterranean is. Uh, central uh, to uh, this project, and we have been uh, working on different uh, world fronts, and this project faces an emergency. We need to uh, create an area where we can raise awareness and innovate around the Mediterranean Basin. Our objective is to federate the uh, actors of energy transition in the Mediterranean. We also want to drive a permanent dialogue. It is a crucial uh, nowadays. We need a dialogue between science and the general public. We need to uh, connect the dot with uh, science, uh, with a culture, with economic players. and we still need to raise awareness among the general public so the general public can also access a training and now uh, there are different actions in the field of education that are being carried out and then we will hear about a really concrete project in that field. We share an ambition indeed with uh, four pillars. We still need to uh, uh, structure research, education, training and project guidance. Research is at the heart of the project as well as the mobilization of scientists from all around the Mediterranean Basin. Together they can co-build training content uh, and they will benefit from the coordination of the Scientific Council that is the International Mediterranean Scientific Council. The aim is to provide a content for uh, training courses, training courses for national educational systems. There will be trainings, there will be uh, exchanges with uh, managers and uh, starting from this all the way to uh, trainings in the classroom, training and education in the classroom uh, to uh, provide, uh, to educate students. Our ambition is to uh, multiply the number of projects dedicated to energy transition around the Mediterranean basins. We uh, want to uh, build uh, school uh, networks. I know you; it is really important to you. We need to uh, focus on territorial school, territorial-based uh, uh, school networks, and inter-territory school networks all around the Mediterranean basin. Let me give you an example of our cooperation, of the cooperation with the ministry and the educational local authorities. Very soon we will create a campus that will uh, provide information about the different skills needed in the field of the energy transition and we will focus on areas such as waste or water and this a campus will uh, work, will involve the whole basin. There will be activities 
around the Mediterranean basis, and we already have a project in uh, Tunisia, there will be uh, training courses uh, suited to local issues. And now beyond national education, there is a strong partnership with university, uh, above all with the University of Aix-Marseille, since we are uh, planning, we are preparing uh, trainings in uh, different areas such as social science. Indeed, we want to connect different subjects and co-build once again training courses for existing master or if and for a future master course that will revolve around the Mediterranean. Finally, and I'll leave the floor to Francoise after that, need focuses on what's possible. We have dedicated 136 hectares to uh, the NEED project, uh, so so there will be a project and programs from kindergarten to school with training courses about agriculture and permaculture. So we need to be uh, pragmatic to show that we're moving forward. So that's why we joined this project. We want to be a place where there will be experiments, where we'll be moving forward. So we want a site where Everything is possible, which means that there will be research experiments. So it is a school from kindergarten to high school. This uh, site can host uh, schools and address uh, the uh, awareness, educational needs. And this school and the uh, director of the school is here. So I'd like to pay tribute to him. So this uh, will use all the resources available on the spot. This site is uh, uh, nested in nature. And so this school will use all the resources offered uh, by agroecology. Jacques Jalbert is here and works on uh, this in this area. Furthermore, this uh, school will use the expertise of the many uh, authors that are active in the uh, wild uh, world. In so there are articles being written, and uh, uh, this a person was asked, are you optimistic? And he said, no, I am not, but I don't want my little daughter to uh, turn towards me one day and tell me you knew what was happening and you did nothing. The message here is that we need determination. And we have created this school called Domaine du Possible, a place where everything possible. Our foundation will create training courses according to specific areas and we will uh, now uh, focus on uh, hosting and welcoming uh, education. So, and as you know, it is urgent to act. Sorry, I forgot one thing. Uh, this uh, project was also based uh, on a, a, a great and long uh, th thought uh, reflection. So we have been acting, we've been uh, working on living uh, organisms, and we have met people from uh, all level, actors uh, at every level, and we all agree on the fact that we uh, need to act very soon. So this uh, figure one means that only have one minute left, right? I am uh, delighted to present this uh, project uh, at the Congress. 
I uh, wanted uh, to make a, a 10 minute summary, but now I only have one minute, so it will be only a few sentences. So first of all, let me thank all those who worked alongside us to undertake to, to implement this project. Uh, I would like to thank everybody who has had to work uh, hard. This work has started at the COP21. Since France was lucky enough to host such a remarkable event, and this event was the uh, first driver of everything that happened after that. I will not go into details uh, in, uh, about the, the different steps we've followed because it's, uh, it's, it's been a five-year uh, five work, but in the end, we achieved a, a COP civilization with about 50 uh, school teachers. Why did we choose to uh, turn to uh, this uh, model? Well, when we started working on this uh, acculturation uh, uh, project, we have worked alongside the scientific community, and there, uh, we have realized that the scientific culture could become a, co a culture common to all. That was our first target. However, uh, we have uh, implemented a COP simulation exercises, and that's when we realized that uh, climate change is uh, everywhere. Everywhere talks about it. It has, it holds its rightful place in the debate, in our conversations. But uh, now what we need is to uh, improve our behavior. So we have a scientific culture, but this doesn't mean that we act when we're faced uh, with this issue. So that's why this a COP exercise is a great. Our target was uh, to uh, focus on the scientific culture and to make sure that those who focus on the scientific culture uh, become, become actors of science. Let me tell you why. When you are at international events, you want to negotiate with an international actor who will defend its own ambition, then you need to have strong arguments. That's when you realize that our international challenges are uh, hard to face. So we need a broad knowledge in order to face them. And now, to conclude with, can I, can I go on? I would like to thank our friends here because we worked with researchers in sociology and I'd like to pay tribute to them. But to sum up, uh, we, uh, we uh, talked to our colleagues who participated in the COP event, and after a few days of work, they were exhausted. But we managed to organize this negotiation exercise. We finally faced each other with our arguments, and we realized that when, when we carried out this negotiation, we became actors. We became active, and that was the whole point of this exercise. Three weeks later, we asked the teachers if they were going to uh, make this exercise with their students uh, two or three years ago, and they agreed. They said, yes, we want uh, to do this simulation uh, too. Our aim is to have a trainer for this a kind of simulation in each uh, uh, educational district. I am finished, Mr. Minister. Thank you very much, and hello to everyone. I am uh, delighted to be with you in Marseille today. 
I think I'm going to have an office uh, in Marseille from now on, and I'm very happy about this because I love Marseille. I'm happy to be here because we've been talking about this Congress at the Ministry of uh, Education for a while, uh, and uh, we have thought about this Congress to regroup all the efforts that you make on a daily basis so the education for sustainable development becomes a reality for our students. I am very happy to see my friends, Guillaume Saint-Denis, François Nissen, and uh, my new friends, the two of you, but to be with you uh, with uh, people who uh, really uh, are pioneers in this uh, topic and uh, are fighting for this cause for a while and see it progress, of course, too slowly, but progress anyway. And what Guillaume Saint-Denis said about the biodiversity being recognized as the climate change, uh, they are really twin subjects, in fact. It is very important. It is all the more important that I've always considered since we talk about education for sustainable development that the question of biodiversity uh, we sh is a subject where we can make our students more actors uh, of uh, and it's less abstract than when we talk about climate change. The logic of the hummingbird uh, is going to be uh, easier to grasp when we talk about bio biodiversity. And fighting against biodiversity means fighting against climate change. Our capacity to be an actor of the renewal of biodiversity uh, is something I believe in. There's no fatality if everybody plays their part. We will have a renewal of biodiversity. It is not impossible. It goes with through the younger generations and children in France, but in all countries, of course. As soon as we have the schools lined up, we have a lever for the whole society. I remind you um, the numbers, one million at the education ministry, uh, students in 60 different uh, places in France, if you put all that in action, you actionate, of course, a major part of the population, but that has an impact on families, on the environment of the families, etc. People are um, wanting me to keep time, so I have to make sacrifice on time as well. So um, I'm obviously uh, of the tangent right now. So I'm going to try to uh, stay uh, to the point. So this is a very important point. Uh, we have the opportunity to influence our students directly, the families, the local communities. Uh, I have in mind a college in the Val d'Oise, which is the greater Paris region. I have, I think of a lot of various uh, schools in, in and some in this particular college, uh, they uh, reduced the energy bill by half by making savings, and they tried. They made some initiatives by growing a farm and uh, in the school. So at the end of the day, the town it replicated what the children invented. So it has to be done uh, in the right way. Uh, it. We have to make sure that children can be the levers uh, with the adults. So the education here plays a key role. So we have uh, um, validated the education for sustainable development for a while. Now it should be concrete, and it should be concrete actions as well. Uh, transmission in theory is uh, we take the risk, like for IT, you know, to have a sup superficial culture of all the students on the topic. So every day they will repeat, oh, watch out for climate change. It's the same thing that if you look at that, the IT knowing how to use your smartphone, it's not enough. We uh, must hand them down a real scientific uh, culture and that joins other stakes than the environmental emergency. We could see with the, the, all these irrational movements that are coming up and that are based in a lack of culture, scientific culture. So we're going to take more initiatives in the months to come. We have a math plan in France, so no teacher in primary school will escape those fundamental knowledge 
in math, we'll do the same thing for science. And of course, with sustainable development, we'll do the same thing as of primary school to give momentum to this scientific culture, which is key and that uh, participates to uh, uh, theoretical transmission. We really need a basis, foundations of knowledge for our children. And then there are the skills of our children. That's all they're asking for. I visited dozens of classes where we took them to the fields, to the forest, to see nature. Even if you come from an urban area, you need to do that to acquire the knowledge and then to be able to act on the living. So it is very important that we stay in this momentum. Of course, we're not starting from scratch. That's uh, good. It's just been amplified throughout the years, but now we want to get to the next level. And this Congress must be an important moment for this new step that we are about to get to. So the theme today is the Mediterranean region. I wanted to talk about that uh, with a number of points that are linked. Uh, I don't need to repeat what was said uh, brilliantly before me by Guillaume Santini on the Mediterranean challenge, which is a civilization challenge and cultural topics may never be separated from the natural topics. Uh, he said it very well. Um, but what uh, is clear is that uh, the Mediterranean region is a case for education uh, for sustainable development. And that also implies foundations at school and this interdisciplinarity in action. We can see it with the action around the Mediterranean region for the French Mediterranean students, for their peers from other Mediterranean countries and for all the students in France because the Mediterranean basin can be seen and known by all the French students. There are some commitments that are at the basis of what we could do now, the uh, Barcelona Convention and the Protocols of 1976, which defined a Mediterranean strategy for education. We have uh, with the Mediterranean strategy for sustainable um, development since 2014, which embarked the ministers of the environment and will get also the ministers of education on board in the Barcelona Convention um, that was held in Athens in 2016. Everything is being uh, va uh, respected. The plan has been approved by the ministers of education of European countries in Cyprus, and our goal is to help countries to promote the education for sustainable development within their, edu their uh, curriculum. So will be chairing, uh, France will be chairing that since January 1st, the uh, sustainable education to sustainable development is going to be a leading theme. I communicate a lot with my European colleagues uh, of education and we want to make it a European goal so no student in Europe would not know the fundamentals and I really insist on the word fundamentals of education for sustainable development. Promote research for sustainable development is another uh, pillar uh, defined by the UN and among the tools is the blue plan and the plan for Mediterranean f of the UN. We have read recently a report that was well documented on the state of the Mediterranean uh, uh, environment, the red. And this is a report that we should all read and f know about. This all is based on actors. If uh, it's not uh, taken over by the actors, there's a need project. Uh, we've just discussed it, the Foundation Mediterranean, which will create a place dedicated to environmental transmission in the Mediterranean. This ambition joins what we want to do at our level of education um, national education is to have in each French academy uh, the possibility to participate in this need project because all of this goes with the plan for sustainable development that is in each district of France, school district in France, and we have scientific partnerships as well which will back this momentum. I'm thinking about all the museums, all the natural history museums, museums dedicated to the environment. So there will be a edu huge education work uh, underway 
and uh, every and concrete measures as well. I'm thinking about the work that uh, all the project leaders in the Academy of Sustainable D uh, Development, what you do in the Academy of Ex Marseille. Um, there have been, for example, um, a lot of things being done from this respect. And uh, the collaboration between uh, the rectorate and Nice is being uh, validated by a work uh, partnership with the project leaders. There's a simulation uh, of the UN plan. It's a great way to learn. It's very ped pedagogical and it also uh, talks about the fundamental cause and the arguments that can be made for the cause. So we talk about the reform of high school. There's a lot to be said around this education for sustainable development. If you know about the scientific projects for all classes, where we dedicated a big place to sustainable development, there's also all the specialty learnings uh, in uh, natural science, but not only in physics and chemistry, and also throughout all the literature, the literature, you know, and then uh, the uh, oral exam where people will be, the student will be required to ask on the, these fundamental knowledge. The, of course, the students will choose the themes with the professors. I looked at many of them, and a lot of them wanted to talk about the education for sustainable development. And even last year, after the year of pandemics, uh, they dedicated dozens of hours to work on the uh, projects on sustainable development, not just a long lived to sustainable uh, development, but to really get into details, scientific details of form concrete actions. We also need to take stock of what's being done and take a dynamic uh, action with the SDGs. But uh, the SDG 4-5, uh, making an assessment is being uh, quite uh, aware of what has been done before. We're doing at the inter-ministerial uh, level. I'm very happy to be with Berenger Rabat today because since she uh, took up her position, we've been uh, working together. Uh, we need to talk about scientific culture. And so there's several ministries that are joining forces on this. When you see the Cité des Sciences is open up to our students, we can multiply the examples. But we need to go forward on the two issues that I mentioned in the Mediterranean framework, but in the international framework, in the European framework, but international as well, and in, that, in the French perimeter. And to do that, we have uh, to fine tune our knowledge. Those are the stakes uh, for the education. An example that I will give you, you know that in primary school, we have a problem uh, and that uh, shows our decline in math is the fact that 95% of our teachers have a training in human science, which is a good thing in itself but they also need to have a training in exact science. And so we started this uh, year, this uh, school year, we decided to start training the young uh, candidates who know that they want to become teachers, uh, a culture that is based on two legs, literature, but science. And those are the next pioneers for sustainable development because this is the first generation that will start having this training. So this is an example in terms of uh, continuous vocational training with a science plan that is uh, going to uh, take place after the math plan. No teacher will be able to escape to it. They will all have to be trained with this math plan and science plan. And this is going to be very participative. Uh, they're going to be working among peers and decide what they need to reach the foundations that they need to be able to teach the students. So we have a major stake with the students, which I said throughout the programs, the school programs. 
to go back to primary school and uh, middle school and beyond uh, the knowledge of our students, we need to put in action all that. When we had the walk for climate in 2019, I suggested the high school students to meet to define our strategy. And those strategies came up with a roadmap in eight points, which is really our compass now. I really, I strictly respected it. And among these eight points, there is 250 eco delegates. Uh, many of you know it, some may not know. We have to really count on those 250,000 eco delegates. These are our hummingbirds who can make a difference on the ground, making sure that, for example, the school cafeteria is uh, serving organic food and working very concretely on what's going to be their future as persons, as citizens, as professionals, because education and sustainable development will be becoming the levers of uh, tomorrow's uh, life and we need to join economics and sustainable development to have a planet that could let us live in harmony. So I am very happy to be with you today. I want to greet the work of the IUCN and all these fundamental pressing issues that they are tackling of uh, environment and biodiversity. Thank you all. I would like to thank everyone. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Thank you for this uh, session about education and the Mediterranean. And now there will be uh, the uh, second session of uh, uh, for today about education. Ladies and gentlemen, and now we will start a second uh, session, the second part of the first session. There will be the signatory convention in the field of sustainable development. Mr. Minister of Education, oh, here he is. So, uh, okay, we will uh, now just turn around. We will need to turn around towards the back wall with the inscription Liberty, Equality, and Fraternity. Good morning, everyone. And now there will be the signature of the Convention for Education in Sustainable Development with Réserve Naturelle de France, Francis Nature Parks. I invite Mr. Uh, Minister of Education, Jean-Michel Blanquer, the Secretary of State of the Ministry of Ecological Transition, Berenger Abba, and the uh, Director of Réserve Naturelle de France. Good morning, everyone. Mr. Minister Jean-Michel Blanquer, Mrs. President, uh, Mr. Chair Charlotte, we are delighted to have reached this uh, moment. Uh, so the moment we uh, uh, conclude a partnership with the Ministry of Education and the Reserve Naturelle de France. Uh, this convention is about raising awareness. Raising awareness is essential. We're delighted to work with uh, teams on the ground, uh, educational team that are passionate about the field of expertise and that help students to learn uh, close to the ground, to learn about these challenges that are uh, getting more and more difficult uh, to respond to. So we need to address all these issues connected to nature. Thank you for this partnership. And the aim of this convention is to strengthen our educational programs along with all uh, local actors, that is, local authorities and the uh, teaching world, so we uh, can 
raise awareness about our ecosystem and the fact that everything is interconnected. Many young people will take part in these exchanges and field trips and uh, these activities are essential. So now nature uh, receives an enhanced uh, financial backing from the state. Uh, we uh, have uh, 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 increased our funding, especially for a uh, nature and this will legitimize our action and the teams that are active here there are also local schools a local school network are really active and mr minister i think we'd like to thank your team for this great work we see that young people uh, are committed and uh, they uh, start being committed with these activities and after they keep on they pursue their commitment so thank you to both of you thank you very much uh, mrs minister mr minister of education i am delighted to be here to sign and renew this framework agreement along with you you mentioned the connection between science and education it is at the heart of what our uh, people uh, do in our uh, nature parks uh, there are 157 to this day it is a place where people can make Make discoveries and learn and uh, we uh, have uh, we try to preserve biodiversity to fight against climate change so uh, there's no best way than to invite students to come see us and learn and we have many partners my partnership with the OFB and with the ministry I'm happy we can renew them and to conclude, since I know I need to be brief, here's a, a, a guide about nature, culture, and art. So uh, our network could develop new actions, bring together young people so that they can uh, learn about the uh, natural heritage they have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll be brief. This agreement is really important uh, to me. It is in uh, in line with what we just said, with the word you just pronounced. You say that students need to know what nature is. Well, is this true? And it goes for students who live in urban areas or rural areas but it's especially true for rural uh, urban areas they're far away from nature and not to mention uh, screens that uh, take a lot of time of, the, of our students uh, time to which students dedicate a lot of time we should provide students with uh, roots as well as uh, wings and we need a uh, concrete actions like for example organizing school trips in a nature park so that students can learn to get to know plants and wild species there are already uh, really uh, beautiful things going on in this we and now we're renewing this convention but there is good news we are working together with other ministries and now our ministry is also dedicated to sports and the youth which means that we uh, work on every aspect of uh, youth for example this summer we have promoted a project where by uh, students can uh, take uh, school uh, trips uh, by bike to um, discover uh, the uh, territory so we need a systemic a holistic vision of our children for our children and uh, we need to take action to respond to our challenges we're the one who will uh, drive these actions 
uh, we will, but we need you to uh, act too, because everything happens at the local uh, level in the world of uh, the of, of schools uh, within a uh, sport associations uh, all these entities uh, will be uh, impacted and uh, positively affected by the convention we sign here because uh, this convention is also about outdoors uh, sports uh, activities i am delighted to sign this convention alongside you today hello everyone um so we should start a session on the coastal area with the coastal conservatory, Conservatoire du Littoral. I am uh, the vice manager of the Conservatoire du Littoral. François uh, who's a Fouché, who's a delegate for the region Provençal Côte d'Azur. And then we'll talk about the salt deposits as well. This is very important for the conservatory because it is its first uh, mission to protect the French coastal area. Why doing that? The coastal area is rich and fragile. It is rich in terms of uh, biodiversity, in terms of uh, landscapes, in terms of economic benefits for the actors of the territory. It is uh, fragile because it is the interface between the land and the sea, between marine ecosystems and land ecosystems that are fragile as well. And this is the balance point between those two ecosystems. Uh, why is it fragile? Because man is very attracted by the coastline and more and more so. So the coast now is 4% of the French territory and it's 10% of the population of France that lives on the coast. So we, and there are over 60% of the world population that lives in coastal areas. So it has a very big attractiveness for men, hence pressures on the habitats. So when we created the conservatory of the coastline, we wanted to find a building to protect this richness and to mitigate uh, this uh, fragile ex uh, aspect. So we, our assignment is to uh, buy land on the coast to protect them in a sustainable way. And thanks to uh, public lands, uh, we were able to acquire those lands that will become the world human heritage. So we protect more than 200,000 hectares throughout the coastline with this policy that was started in 1975. So a very peculiar uh, mission uh, of marine protected areas that is very uh, particular, a government's model that is very peculiar as well. Uh, the state will uh, try to, will start working with the local actors and the local authorities. Now it seems quite uh, natural because that's what we do every day. Uh, you know, at this Congress, we see all the actors, but in, when in 1975, the state wanted to work with local authorities and local actors, it was quite a bet, a bet that worked and that allowed uh, to put in place uh, many partnerships with the local actors. So this governance means that the people who manage the land once they are acquired will be as a priority the local authorities the local communities uh, public uh, st institutions uh, regions uh, other partners and other managers associations but the local communities will be the prime managers so that makes them sorry, uh, an alliance uh, and a government's model that is very inclusive in the territories. Today, we're here to talk about the impact of climate change. How did we start looking at it as of the years 90, 1990? We uh, made an assessment at the beginning of the years 2000 to see with the coastline, uh, the conservatory, what is being affected 
by climate change, and we realize that 1% of the territory is uh, submitted to erosion, and 20% will be uh, submitted to submersion as of 2050, uh, will be underwater uh, as of 2050. So as a landlord, we could measure the effect of climate change on our property. So regarding this, we um, thought about how we do ma how do we manage this, knowing that the coastline has been uh, set a certain way throughout centuries because uh, we've uh, won over sea or rather bored from the sea uh, these uh, this coastline to protect our human activities. But in the face of climate change, these activities are being challenged in the next decades. So we are wondering now, uh, we wondered now in the years 2000 when we put up some projects, first of all, in the coastline of Dor Normandy with the local actors, how we can find ways to uh, plan the coastline in order to prevent this uh, submer marine submersion. The last project we had, uh, it's the project Adapto, which uh, Guillemette will present to us. So I will, I don't want to be uh, too long uh, because uh, the delegation uh, of the Provence Côte d'Azur uh, will tell us more about it. What mattered to us when we put this uh, project Adapto together, who has been recognized by the European Union. It was a milestone. The conservatory is uh, nearly 50 years old and carried out on a number of sites some management models that were quite experimental based on uh, analysis uh, by the scientific committee. and. Uh, models of um, dune management uh, as a free dunes that required from our part a better communication. Second thing is uh, with the issues linked to uh, climate events that are quite extraordinary, uh, uh, many tempests, the necessity appeared to implement these projects on a broader scale at the level of the territory. So we concerted ourselves and the conservatory decided to put 10 sites together to add in with a different implementation. In 20 years, we hadn't built a dig or we had left it with rocks and with a really minimalist uh, ma management. And in some territories, we went further and we had uh, left nature go back, grow back in a very natural way. In On the 10 sites, uh, some uh, where it was urgent to act and we associated the local population to the projects. So 10 sites throughout the national territory. Uh, today we have about 40 sites that were not in the initial European project. Well, you see on the little scheme on the right, uh, we made sure that these projects would be uh, not standardized, but that they would take into consideration these six goals that we've identified, which is to trigger consultation processes based on a very uh, fine study of the situation. Of course, taking stock of the natural heritage, analysis, a very fine analysis of the socioeconomic aspects, particularly uh, those that are linked to the management of natural risks or agriculture, fisheries or agriculture, uh, an impact 
which is not a direct impact, but that is there, which is the management of natural risks by putting in place uh, such processes we have to manage the hazards those who don't know what a hazard uh, natural hazard is it's uh, implying an impact on the economic activities and people so of course would like to try to avoid putting those at risk and the management of uh, natural risks some is is quite obvious in many cases. Uh, an educational approach, but most important is the landscape. It is very difficult in certain territories to uh, take just a strict inventory of the heritage and just say, okay, we have such and such species, we need those other species and we need to protect them all. That's what we've done uh, for many years, but the landscape approach uh, is uh, a better way to, to make the projects bring change to the population. It doesn't work every time, it doesn't work right away, but it works better because the landscape is uh, universal language. What seems important to us and would like to tell you is that we participated like the IUCN to make sure that our natural spaces be recognized as service suppliers with socioeconomic approach and with a management that is less costly, that will be less costly over time. Uh, I mentioned uh, the risks that can be uh, mitigated with the management of the natural uh, resources and this uh, definition of landscape which uh, gets on board the local populations. The law of 1930 on the protection of sites and landscapes was already mentioning it, so it's not a novelty, it's not a revolution. The management is of the coastal line is really working and preparing the future because we'll see the results in the, pre on the, fu on the f in the future. So we included historians and uh, anything that has to do with landscape is to be measured over the long term. The landscape approach is key and uh, you're going to see here the uh, explanation that you will get from this excellent uh, example that were chosen. So let's see what's happening in the salt deposits of the Camargue region. How is it being managed? This site is uh, combined to the ADAPTO program, but it is a site that is iconic. Uh, on the international level, everybody knows the Camargue region and um, there's some documentaries on the region. So, you could see on the left the lands that we bought from the Compagnie des Salins in blue that are 5,600 hectares at the point of Bauduc uh, in the front line, uh, an activity in red that is remains active. And then the natural reserve of Camargue, uh, lands uh, of the department over thousands of hectares, and then the natural reserve of the Tour du Valais, that is a foundation of uh, private research and uh, that uh, is listed as the natural reserve. So the dynamic on that uh, area of Bauduc, we don't talk about climate change, we just talk about the coastline dynamic. And at the Conservatoire uh, du Littoral, we'd like to talk about the 100-year mark. If you see that between 1942 and 2012, 
there have been some accretion of 950 meters and erosion of 435 meters, we're looking at very big dynamic. So the idea for the conservatory is to observe and support and work with nature rather than imagining if we had made some uh, buildings there in this uh, area, it would have mean uh, cost, a very heavy cost. So we're looking at some very strong phenomenon that climate change is going to worsen, of course. And uh, the strategy uh, is that uh, to stabilize uh, this coastline, this uh, coast mark, is not manageable on the long term. And there's a strategy of 10 kilometers, this dam on the, on the sea that is be, be, beyond, behind the, the coastline and pre, um, plans for an adaptive management of these uh, hectares. So you can see some old dams that let gradually the water come in and also some elements to reconstitute the dam on the back because the dam was also a factor of aggravation of the loss of sediments of what you can't really see but that is uh, under the sea and under the ground a little bit if you want to rest a tooth on the gum and the gum is not in good shape so that's uh, we tend to promote solutions based on nature and we observe in those cases that far from solving the problem, the dam only made it worse. A system of a healthy nerve can uh, help dealing with all of the climate changes and the tempests with a system that we're going to let reconstitute itself. Beyond, uh, beyond our management activities on the front line, we work on the ecological continuity and we must ensure a continuity between the sea and the uh, hydro, uh, hydraulic system of the Camargue area. As you can see, uh, for 70 years, we have tried to contain the Rhone River with barriers, ever higher barriers on the front line. So we have a put, and then we have destroyed the delta dynamic. Although it is true that there are still activities going on with uh, tourism, for example, but that was a natural dynamic and it would be really difficult to uh, reinstate it. So the deltas have disappeared, rivers have disappeared, continuities have been broken, and in Bouduc nowadays, it uh, is uh, quite a specific uh, specific uh, situation ecosystem wants to create life to be to renew life uh, all and we have done w everything we've done these past years was to try to fight this uh, natural uh, dynamic this areas offer us many benefits, benefits that date back to 50 years ago when we hadn't done anything to the area. And when we see the result of our actions today, we can remember everything we could do 50 years ago. 50 years ago, we started to try and control the area and we uh, broke away from the, we, 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 we in prevented nature from developing freely. So now it is over and we are reconquering uh, natural, our natural heritage with the return of specific species like eels, for example. Eels uh, need a discontinuity between the land and the sea. We also uh, see a different algae uh, coming back and obviously we protect uh, dunes uh, too. 
when we uh, got, when we arrived, there uh, were dunes, so we uh, tried to respect nature, but to also to respect its cycles and its needs. So that's uh, when we have uh, also created uh, equipment like a nat artificial uh, parcels to help uh, make progress and now they are slowly backing away to uh, let nature take its rightful place and uh, uh, so rewilding is a really interesting uh, uh, subject and uh, there's uh, we, we talk about it all the time your presentation is really interesting it shows everything we have tried to control we've tried to control uh, natural spaces natural areas but this is a new we started trying to control nature in the 19th century and now we are starting to regain what was uh, nature, the nature that we tried to control in, in 1950. And now I turn towards the uh, Toulon Mediterranean local collectivities. We are going to talk about rewilding on another natural site, another uh, natural area that has benefited from the ADAPTO program. And um, I would like to give you an overview of our uh, natural area. Uh, this is a very uh, fragmented uh, picture because you, it is quite hard. When you see the picture, it is quite hard to see where the coastline is. So you can see it is, but there is, as you can see, an interface between the land and the sea. And within this interface, we have cultivated, we have, uh, we have worked on salt for a long time. So, uh, we, uh, what we wanted uh, to do uh, was to uh, let nature uh, take its right, and we have uh, carried out a study. There are uh, to some of this study. There are three main key points. We have uh, first of all analyzed the evolution of the coastline, so we uh, could identify sediment uh, transit. Uh, this uh, area isn't really subjected by um, the tide, and there is a high tide for a few days a year. There is and but only a few years, a few days per year. So we have uh, carried out a study about this uh, coastline uh, over 100 uh, years. On the uh, photo, the purple line this back shows the coast in 1920 and. Uh, uh, what we uh, discovered is that we discovered that there has been a, a strong erosion and we have uh, managed to identify a sediment a transit uh, that is uh, that amounts to 1,100 cubic meters a year. So we uh, carried out the study from the east to the west. The second key point of the uh, study results, we uh, mapped uh, the uh, uh, Posidonia seabed uh, barrier reef that is along this uh, coast, and that is a natural barrier to uh, a tidal uh, wave. So there you can see the seabeds getting out of the water along the coastline, and there's a seabed stretches on 1006 1600 meters we have studied the uh, evolution of the coastline over the years and as you can see on the picture there are lines with different colors which represent the coastline over the years and uh, the evolution of the coastline can help us understand how uh, the how hydraulic facilities were supplied and fed over the years so obviously we know that there's not a one uh, solution, but we have uh, managed to uh, reinforce a uh, dune. We uh, tried to uh, 
to fill the gaps and uh, we uh, have helped uh, the we have followed the uh, withdrawal movement of the coastline we have uh, adapted to the evolution of the coastline so how uh, can we build a connection between the longley basin who doesn't open up onto the sea and uh, the uh, salt deposit so that was our objective and in order to reach it we have uh, carried out a study we, uh, we have uh, made a model of the coastline withdrawal we have uh, carried out different studies and we have identified different uh, sites where we could make the uh, connection uh, there were uh, possible sites on the Langley uh, website on the Langley uh, air natural area we have carried out restoration uh, actions and we have seen again a withdrawal of the coastline which means that with a, every time there is a storm the coastline withdraws but it uh, still uh, strikes a balance a sedimentary balance the sediment balance is preserved and uh, now we uh, started uh, i will go talk about the uh, works that have been uh, done in 2019 and 2020 the first phase was managed by the uh, coastline preservation agency the conservatoire du littoral the uh, June strip has been rebuilt with uh, marine sand or sand that is uh, similar to June sand. Uh, so we uh, could rebuild this uh, strip and make it homogeneous. And we have also created another uh, trail, a BIS uh, trail. And this uh, trail goes along the coastline. There is high demand for this uh, type of trail. And then we removed rocks on 340 meters. Second, and now the second phase that uh, took place that started in October 22, uh, we uh, removed rocks on a further uh, 250 meters. So it was crucial for us to keep on uh, removing uh, rocks. We uh, worked with a caution uh, that's what we were asked to do so that's why we chose to work in uh, two steps so we we needed to remove rocks on a, a sufficient uh, distance uh, to uh, uh, avoid uh, further attacks on the coastline and we have reinforced uh, our uh, bases so that some embankments uh, were higher than uh, 250 uh, 2 meters 50 so to, in order to uh, avoid this uh, area to be submerged because there have been uh, floodings over uh, the years and we wanted to prevent them from happening again here are a few pictures that show you the uh, area before and after the works, after the uh, renovation works. See, that's a picture from September 2019 with a rock strips. Uh, that was the uh, first embankment. It wasn't uh, perfect. Sometimes we had to use uh, construction materials to fill the gap. So that is an artificial embankment. The beach has, uh, is gone. And uh, then there are rocks, and then there are uh, there is the coastline. And now in May 2021, you can see a huge a change. And but actually, I could have given you a picture of May 2020 because it was then the coast was uh, almost uh, ready. But there were there were two storms during the during the first phase of the works in 2019. Uh, so there uh, were uh, two storms and these uh, storms created uh, challenges however the uh, coastline has regained uh, its uh, uh, new condition and has helped us uh, form this really nice beach 
And here are pictures from another area that is a little further away. This picture was taken during the first phase of the works. And uh, so as you can see, there was a lot of erosion. A micro cliff uh, was created by nature and uh, we uh, decided we should do more so in uh, 2021 we removed rocks on two further meters the as you can see the micro cliff is gone and the coastline is now free to uh, change as it wishes again thank you very much Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I think we will stop our session with these pictures, which uh, shows that how fast nature uh, comes back and takes control of uh, the environment. So uh, if you have any question, do you can ask it now, although we don't have a uh, time uh, left before the next session. Thank you very much. I wanted to uh, ask you a question about evolution. Do you have uh, pictures of uh, the area before the embankment was created? I would like to see the bit before the embankment and after. And are there uh, differences in the way sediments have uh, deposited? So the ro rocks had been set up had been uh, in uh, in a few decades ago, and uh, we had pictures of the area then. They uh, wanted uh, to uh, preserve uh, the space. So there was a micro cliff created by erosions, and uh, they were so the, the coastline couldn't it wasn't free to evolve uh, their uh, erosion prevented it from doing so and there was a, a sediment uh, the, there was a lacking of sediment a, um, a marina has been uh, created a few kilometers on the east in the 50s and the sediment deficit started then uh, because these uh, facilities isolated uh, the uh, coastline from the sediment. We have a picture that was taken from a plane and it really clearly shows the evolution of coastline, the coastline going back to the way it was. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to take another question. The next session must start now. However, we're here and feel free to come to us and ask us a question. Thank you very much for this uh, session and for showing us such uh, great examples of action carried out by our uh, uh, actors. Uh, so we uh, will uh, start the next session in a few minutes. It will be a session about the national strategy about biodiversity. We will talk about the actions taken by the Ministry of the Armed Forces for Biodiversity. And this session will be uh, presented by uh, the Secretary of State uh, is responsible for biodiversity, um, Beranger Rabat, and the, minister, and the Minister for the Armed Forces. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the session that will be dedicated to a conversation between Madame Secretary of State for Biodiversity, Madame Abba, and Madame Florence Parly, who is the Minister of Armed Forces. The session of this morning will be dedicated to a dialogue on the stakes to elaborate the future national strategy of biodiversity strategy that is underway under the steering of the Minister of uh, Energy Transition and Madam uh, Secretary of State for Biodiversity, a strategy that will be inclusive but very uh, interministerial because the idea will be to mobilize all the public policies around these uh, challenges of biodiversity. Madam Secretary of State, you have the floor. 
hello and hello again, Madam Minister. Dear Florence Parly, thank you for being with us this morning. Um, the work uh, done among all the ministers that we've been conducting for at least a year uh, is uh, being fruitful and we're very happy to be looking at those challenges together, uh, ladies and gentlemen, actors of the biodiversity. Um, you were all waiting for this moment and uh, we all know what the armed force contain in terms of richness and biodiversity and the commitments that we uh, made for a while have been uh, turning in concrete today. This is the first plan, the first ministerial strategy on this uh, interministerial work that we've doing. doing. All the ministries will present their roadmap and the Ministry of the Armed Forces is ahead of the game and they will present to us this strategy that is very exhaustive. Uh, we need to fight again the erosion of biodiversity and that must be integrated in all our policies, whether it's uh, economics, uh, agriculture, health, education. Jean-Michel Blanquer was with us this morning to discuss it commitments that are very strong and that show the consistency between our various uh, public policies. Uh, we are managing to combine all these stakes among all the ministries and turn them into roadmaps at the national and international level. You know that in a few months we'll meet again for the COP uh, for the biodiversity the COP15, a COP15 that we hope will be uh, very strong in terms of uh, mobilization as well as the COP21 was for climate with the Paris Agreement. We need to be fully committed and you know that in 2022 France will be chairing the Union, the European Union, so we have a responsibility to take everything that we'll be fighting for, whether it's due among be, this uh, national strategy for biodiversity or with the Ministry of the Armed Forces, these are all different pathways to um, share, uh, to express our message. So we've been working on this uh, protected area strategy for a while, so we'll see the impact. So with the army we are working on a national strategy uh, on the fight against deforestation with uh, with guidelines that affect 10 percent of uh, the gnp all our communities and uh, all the ministries are committed to not take place into deforestation even if it happens on the other side of the world with the products that we consume with the major work done on the means and resources dedicated to biodiversity. The Ministry of the Armed Forces is doing its share of the work and uh, we thank him for that. Uh, we got some uh, financing that is huge this year with the credits, uh, the biodiversity credits. Uh, I want to thank the uh, parliamentaries for that. Uh, part of the recovery plan as well with I know as far as I'm concerned what's happening with my ministry, but you may want to add everything that we're deploying uh, with the recovery plan on the energy transition, on the forest, with uh, many funds in the area of water as well. We have nearly 1 billion euro that have an impact on the preservation of biodiversity. So today, uh, this is a very historic moment. We have uh, means and resources that will allow us to put in place these strategies with human resources, because in order to implement all these plans, we need to have people on the ground actors, uh, whether they are scientists, uh, naturalists uh, coming from the world of the education or the armed forces. So these roadmaps uh, with a very active presence of all our ministers on this Congress that I thank for. This uh, is a very historic uh, and exempl exemplary moment where we'll serve as a roadmap for other ministries uh, with uh, the implementation of a natural heritage that you manage, which is a huge capital. And we're very aware 
of the impact of uh, the climate change and biodiversity. It's uh, about the carbon reserves that will protect by preserving these areas and the species that live there. The method is uh, the following. Uh, the, the Ministry of the Armed Forces has uh, tested this method already within the strategy with the operators, with the local associations, with the elected authorities and the communities to make sure that uh, as for the strategy on protected area, we need to address the stakes uh, on the ground close to the realities of uh, the local realities. So, of course, this cooperation with actors go beyond our border. You work with other armed forces at the international level and all that is all of this is very precious for the environmental diplomacy and everything that we can deploy in terms of partnerships. The, our president has announced over the base, the Mediterranean basin, some very objective, uh, ambitious objectives. So it is all very use, useful and precious. We need change. We need some transform, transformative changes and the whole society has to get mobilized so this action can be scaled up. Within the national strategy for biodiversity, we will present, this is a draft for now, we'll present a final version at the beginning of 2022. We are focusing on consultation and in uh, the international and national dimensions. We have a work group that work on the socioeconomic uh, side of the, the issue, the following up of the negotiations strategies and plans. Uh, we need now uh, an agenda and, and uh, KPIs and milestones to really check that we will reach our goals. And we know that uh, we, uh, the armed forces uh, will be joining forces with us. Um, with all this data that are based and collected and are based on three principles, uh, frugalness in the usage, in the consumption, in the spaces. And I know that the policy of the army uh, in this uh, regard is uh, exemplary and should be uh, followed because you are very sensitive to this issue. And that's why we have uh, managed to protect our natural resources, uh, climate uh, policies, and this operation uh, in terms of knowledge. 2030 is the horizon of the strategy that we present to you this morning for the Army and for the biodiversity. But we're already looking at 2050 because we know that reverting the trend of the erosion of biodiversity is going to take more than a couple of decades and uh, this uh, action is over, have to do over time. The Ministry of the Armed Force benefits from many natural sites uh, with the conservation of uh, natural spaces, a long-time partner of uh, the Ministry. With, within the strategy of marine, uh, protected areas, this pooling of resources and I want to uh, greet uh, the Astrolab uh, boats that works on the logistics and the compliance to the regulation in protected areas with the actors on the zone on the site. And this is uh, very precious because uh, we are way beyond the compliance to regulatory framework. We're about uh, constant checking on the ground. So some aspects uh, uh, have an impact on society that has to be mobilized and uh, the armed forces are playing their part in the matter. So there's going to be a training of uh, team members uh, and I thank you for that because that means that we're going to ramp up in our skills and act on the levers that we have to protect the biodiversity. You're putting it in place with technical references and sharing of experiences. 
who are, of course, on your side, the service of the ministry for biodiversity and the water agencies, conservatory of the littoral. Um, Madam Minister, thank you very much. I uh, give you the floor because uh, we are very impatient to present to you the strategy of the Ministry of Armed Forces. And you are the first minister who presents this uh, strategy. We're very happy about it and very proud of it. The uh, Minister of the Armed Forces is the owner and the manager of uh, natural areas in order to comply with his operational obligations. And the Ministry is very active in the prevention against the protection against pollution on the land and on the sea, on the land uh, above all. As uh, we have seen, there have been some prevention against wildfires. So I would like to welcome the commitment uh, of the Ministry of the Armed Forces towards uh, sustainability. Thank you very much, Madam Minister, dear Berenger, representatives, MEPs, green defense, green armies, hybrid vehicles, there's are sound like contradictions and I am sure that many of you will have smiled. The Ministry of the Armed Forces is present today at the uh, World Nature Congress and this is not conflicting at all. And sometimes we have we tend to believe cliches but let me take a few minutes to destroy these cliches so why is uh, biodiversity and the preservation of biodiversity uh, mandatory necessary it is essential because the preservation of biodiversity equates to the preservation of humankind as well as all the ecosystem in which human beings live. We need to ensure that human needs are met as for water resources, for example, because when ecosystems are degraded, food security threatens populations. Our army's aim is to protect French people and to defend our territory and its safety. That's the reason why it is necessary for the Ministry of the Armies to preserve biodiversity. Let me give you a few examples. In Guyana, there is a, a, a development of a very uh, illegal uh, uh, activity that uh, is a direct threat to the health of a local population. This threat is uh, the illicit gold mining. Gold is extracted illegally. They use mercury to uh, isolate gold uh, from the rest. And there is a great damage for the water chain. It is more and more difficult to access drinking water. There is a high uh, mercury content in the water and a fish uh, ten fish suffer from the mercury that ends up in the river. So we've been uh, protecting, we've been fighting against the degradation of uh, the environment in Guyana through an operation called ARPI. But as you know, everything is connected in the environment. So when we fight against the gold mining and its impact on nature, uh, we fight against uh, activities uh, that finance terrorism. Indeed, the World Organization for Illicit Money Flow has shown that the illegal, uh, this environmental crime is nowadays the first source of funding for terrorists.
preserving biodiversity is essential for our armies because today the Ministry of the Armed Forces has the highest carbon footprint in, of the government. And we are transparent about it because we need to be proactive and committed towards energy transition and biodiversity uh, protection. Berenger, you said we are the first state owner of the year and we cover different thousand of hectare uh, kilometers, square kilometers. So that is uh, uh, equivalent to the surface of the Rhone. We act for protecting biodiversity because we know we bear an important responsibility in this respect. We are also aware that we have the capacity and the means to act and to play a crucial role. Let me give you another example. The Navy has actively contributed to protecting biodiversity in our maritime area. As you may know, this is the second maritime area in the world. We call it an exclusive economic area. Nowadays, one force of operational activities carried out by vessels are dedicated to activities on the sea. We fight, for example, against marine pollution, against illegal fishing, and towards protecting protected marine area. Defense and environment are intertwined, as you can see. We will soon have to face new challenges, and these challenges will be exacerbated by the consequences of the degradation of ecosystems and by climate change. President Macron has given me a mission. I will build future armies, armies who we have to face the challenges ahead and that we be able to carry out their mission even when they have a little, if, even when the environment is already degraded. We face huge challenges like terrorism, health, and as of today, the preservation of environment. We cannot protect our co-citizens if our own activities threaten the ecosystems we depend on. That's why I am really proud to be here today alongside Béranger Abba to present you our national strategy for the preservation of biodiversity. This strategy is comprehensive and it is so because I wanted it to tackle issues on land as well as on the sea so we could integrate our armies and federate them around the two challenges. This strategy is based on two pillars. First of all, we need to better understand our natural heritage. And on the second and the second pillar is obviously protecting it. Our first objective is to uh, map out biodiversity in our uh, military uh, post. We need a comprehensive map by 2025. We will collect, analyze, and promote the uh, biodiversity we have on land while the Navy will work with the General Directory for uh, Weapons. We'll uh, develop their knowledge and their expertise in the field of marine biodiversity. Our second objective is to identify the main challenges faced in the field of biodiversity. And we are lucky enough to, uh, uh, to work towards this objective with the National Historical Science Museum. And together, we will uh, improve our strategy. Our third objective is to assess the impact of military operations on biodiversity. This isn't a new uh, objective as we have been adopted some of our operational activities these past years. 
For example, when there is the laying season of one of the largest major raptor we need to protect in Europe, uh, well, when there is the laying season, our uh, air forces don't cross the area where this bird lives because this bird is really sensitive to noise and when it hears noise it goes away from the nest oh and when uh, the uh, when there's the laying season its main target is to protect its egg so we need to uh, strengthen this uh, trend and these actions, uh, especially for the marine area. That's why we will keep on and uh, we will uh, acquire knowledge about marine biodiversity. And these uh, studies uh, can't limit our operational capacities because our operation uh, responds to uh, protection needs of our citizens. However, we can adjust our operation, and that's not the same thing. We need to acquire knowledge about biodiversity, which meets our operational interest. And again, let me give you a few examples. Since the Ministry of the Armed Forces is financing a project co steered with Australia, this project aims to improve the uh, study of uh, the tuna's migration flows in the Pacific so that we could anticipate the future conf uh, uh, conflict afflicted areas. We study uh, ocean areas affected by uh, climate change, and there are vessels who uh, travel in areas they shouldn't be here. So when there is a too, there are too many vessels in a specific areas, then this concentration could may may generate a conflict someday. So that's why uh, it uh, the ministry works on this project. Furthermore, in 2019, we rejoined the Kiwi Kwaka project in partnership with the National History Natural Science Museum. It, uh, this project aims to better understand the behavior of a specific species of birds, and these birds could help us anticipate uh, say, uh, storms. And this project was implemented a few months ago. Some scientists uh, went on board, uh, went, uh, traveled on uh, the military ships, and they followed the, the uh, trajectory of birds directly from the Navy ship. This study could help us better anticipate a storms and tidal waves and this project will help us better understand this species the barge rousse in france and we will uh, help this will make it possible for us to better uh, manage and coordinate the armed forces and help all the people affected by climate change in the pacific ocean this project shows that if we new biodiversity, if we acquire knowledge of biodiversity, we will be able to better protect our citizens. So today we need to ensure a better protection of biodiversity by the armed forces. And I'm going to mention the second pillar of our strategy. First of all, we will better combine our building objectives with building biodiversity. So each time we build a new facilities or a new building, whenever it's possible, we will uh, try and uh, use biosourced materials. We will try to uh, minimize uh, noise and avoid soil artificialization because this practice has a devastating impact on nature. 
we will try and better coordinate our training areas. We will uh, try to ensure the diversity of environments. This region was uh, severely affected this summer, so we need more continuous efforts to uh, manage our military areas. These areas must be opened, but if Obviously, if we let nature follow its natural course, then our army couldn't uh, preserve and maintain its area. But if there are uh, no human activities apart from our operational activities, that is, if there's no agriculture, then nature would follow its course, and then biodiversity uh, will be would be affected. And that might seem ambivalent. But if we don't contain forest, we can't maintain biodiversity. And we need to uh, maintain a diversity of areas with meadows, open areas, and forest in order to uh, drive interactions between species and ecosystems. Similarly, we need diverse environments. We need open areas so that our soldiers, our military will have the best conditions uh, for their training. So we have training areas, that's uh, the first point, but we have tried to, uh, to uh, drive biodiversity. So we uh, tried to uh, multiply uh, green corridors on our on the uh, on our operational areas uh, we have for example uh, in uh, areas we have uh, we have uh, the uh, possibility to develop green corridors in the north of france for example these corridors are in asset because they can ensure the circulation of species and ensure also the uh, uh, the um, species to uh, meet each other. The Ministry of the Armed Forces has signed a convention to, for a carbon offsetting this week. And you tell me, yes, you uh, release a lot of emissions, so you should definitely uh, be active. And we are, since this convention aims to uh, compensate the uh, CO2 emissions of the ministry uh, with uh, nature uh, nature driven uh, solutions we uh, uh, we are make efforts to ensure a better coordination of our meadows and of nature and that's how we will uh, make a contribution to our national uh, strategy against the carbon so now uh, days we do everything we can to implement this strategy and to make it a reality so that's the reason why we we have allocated 3.6 million euros each year from 2022 to ensure this strategy is implemented. So it might seem a huge or a small amount. It is 12 times more than the budget that was allocated to the protection and biodiversity by the Ministry of the Armed Forces in 2017 from 2021. This budget will uh, be uh, worth 2.6 million euros so from this year on and next year there will be 1 million more and we will have 3.6 million euros. So I just mentioned funding but funding resources, financial resources but there are also human resources and as Berger said we be uh, training, um, we'll be training uh, different employees within the ministry. I think training is key uh, to uh, protecting biodiversity. Dear Berenger, let me uh, congratulate you for all the work you've done to draft this national strategy and the Ministry of the Armed Forces is happy to contribute uh, to this strategy. Uh, finally, we will enhance our cooperation with European armies and with different biodiversity actors uh, above all in the uh, Europe.
European uh, program, Life Nature Army. This program will uh, grant us uh, with some uh, funding from the European Union. The ministerial strategy for the preservation of biodiversity that I'm lucky enough to present you today is the fourth step of a, a more a broader strategy that tackles the uh, prevention, the protection, the prevention of natural risk that uh, follows up on energy, renewable energy, and that also addresses uh, our carbon imprint. We are aware that natural resources depletion, droughts, flash floods, coral erosion are much more than natural events. They are human events, but they are also strategical events. They change our maps. They create new uh, tensions. They and they lead to uh, people's displacement and could lead to new conflicts. That's how they exacerbate the usual uh, threats the uh, Ministry of the Armed Forces has been facing for decades. And let me give you a few more examples. In the uh, on on the Arctic Sea. Ice is melting, we'll be discovering new uh, hydrocarbons and some superpowers will soon uh, be interested, like Russia, the United States. Uh, there is a need for uh, more stock, uh, fish stock, uh, because uh, it is declining. So there is more and more tension around fishing areas. In the Pacific, there are more and more storms which means that the armed forces are uh, active there. That's what happened with the Irma cyclone in tw a few years ago. How um, unfortunately, this wasn't an exceptional event. It is a catastrophe that uh, will, uh, and it will repeat, it will be repeated. I, um, ladies and gentlemen, I am aware I don't have enough time anymore. And, but I am also aware that biodiversity and ecosystem degradation are areas that should be tackled by our, my ministry. Thank you for your attention. And uh, as you know, along with Béranger, we are ready to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Minister of the Armed Forces, Madam Florence Parly, Madam Secretary of State for Biodiversity, Madam uh, Berenger Abba. So now we will have a press session at the entrance of the pavilion. So I would like you to move towards the entrance of the pavilion to meet our journalists. 